Good morning. Welcome to uh, an uncharacteristically early morning version of IndyCar. Now you're probably wondering why I've not been on your screens for a while. Well, uh, I've been undergoing a series of treatments over in Edinburgh, uh, medical treatments, and it's meant I've not been able to get out in the car at all, really, for the last few weeks. And that means I'm feeling tired a lot of the time. However, I think it's worth having a show today to discuss a couple of important points which emerged in the last couple of days um, amongst people within the independence community. Now there's a couple of big things I want to get out of the way first of all. The first one is uh, the business of ALBA and the SNP. I've been accused by a number of people of, uh, what should we say, of taking sides. I think that's probably the best way of saying it uh, between one side or another um, over the last few days on Twitter. In fact, one of the re main reasons I very seldom venture onto Twitter is exactly for this reason. That doesn't matter what you say to who you say it, um, you'll always be jumped on by somebody. But let me just reiterate something. I am not against ALBA, neither am I against the SNP or any other pro-independence party. However, I was concerned and still am concerned uh, that we're not seeing a movement <clears throat> in the poll figures for ABBA just yet. But then again, we've had four polls in a week, which is extremely unusual. Uh, and the only reason I can think of why there have been four polls in a week is that people are desperately wanting to find out what effect the emergence of the ALBA party has had on both the ALBA party's uh, polling prospects and those of the SNP. So that's the reason for all the polls, uh, but it's still far too early to tell. We've got three weeks still to go before the election, and a lot of things can happen in that time. So I wouldn't write Alba off. Uh, in fact, I'm on record as saying that I've always been in favour of having a pro-independence party on the list, a purely pro-independence party on the list, one behind which everybody could unite. And that is what Alba is providing. And we're seeing a lot of people transferring from the SNP to Alba. Many good friends of mine are supporting ALBA, so I have nothing bad to say about ALBA at all. Um, you may agree or disagree about the people who are leading it or the actions of a few people within the party, but you can say that about any party. I've heard it said about the Greens recently as well, that uh, the Greens did not act well when they had the opportunity to do some good in uh, Holyrood. They didn't take it, and in fact, um, they acted against the best interests of some demographics. So there are faults on all sides. So I want to apologise to anybody who was offended by anything I said, but I was merely making an observation that at the moment at least ALBA hasn't yet registered the level of support that's required for it to start taking seats. But I think it's largely irrelevant to the whole question of this election because I think no matter what happens there will be a big majority, whether it's a big majority with the SNP and the Greens, whether it's a big majority with the SNP and ALBA, or whether it's some combination of the three, doesn't really matter. As long as that uh, that big majority is present in Holyrood after this election. And that's what we all need to concentrate on. So no matter whom you are planning to vote for with your second vote, I don't care. Really what I want to make sure of is that we use our second votes as effectively as possible based on our own principles and our own views. So I would not uh, criticise anybody for voting for any particular party on the list so long as it's for independence. So let's just leave that aside for a moment and let's look at the bigger questions uh, which arise this week. Now one of the biggest questions which arose yesterday came not from me, but from another independent supporter who asked, I think, one of the fundamental unanswered questions about the um, the timing of this independence referendum. And he put it quite simply. He said, why is it okay for us to have a general election in the middle of a pandemic, but it's not okay to have an independence referendum in the middle of the pandemic? And that is a very interesting question because we have to try and figure out who is it who is actually wanting to delay the independence referendum because of COVID because it's actually not the UK government. They have said nothing about delaying uh, an independence referendum because of COVID. They're basically saying we don't have the right to have an independence referendum at all and they want to deny us that right. So the only people who are actually saying that we shouldn't have an independence referendum in the middle of COVID are actually the SNP. But, and this is a big but, the main reason I believe why uh, they're not keen to go rushing towards an independence referendum 
as quickly as possible is not because of COVID. Because we know from the fact that the Louisa Jordan Hospital has now been completely dismantled and, and has been viewed as completely superfluous now because the virus is under control and because the vaccination program has accelerated through the population. We now have over well over half the population uh, of the country vaccinated and that I would expect to be complete at least with the first injection by July which leaves you wondering well what's the point of delaying the referendum the point of delaying the referendum is not so much to do with COVID I don't think <clears throat> I think it's actually to do with the fact that the recent scandal involving the former and current first minister damaged the independence vote we saw figures um, a few months ago, we saw figures of between 56 and 58 percent in favour of independence. And since the entire scandal surrounding Mr. Salmond and Ms. Sturgeon came to a head, that support has dropped by about six or seven percentage points. So we're now at the point where we have just above the margin of error in the polls for independence, and it's too marginal. We know that the SNP does not want to launch into a referendum without a clear, um, well-established lead in the polls. Now, obviously, people have talked about 60%. That may not be attainable, but 58% would have been a trigger point. But it's not there anymore. So my belief is that the, the SNP wants to wait until they can... Uh, campaign more on independence and bring that support level back to where it was before the Sturgeon and Salmon scandal tore everything apart. So it's possible, I think, that that's the main reason for this. It's not, I don't think, um, adequate to say that we can't have a referendum because of the pandemic. The pandemic, it's not over, but it is well controlled at the moment and it's continuing to decline and it will keep continuing to decline as long as we behave ourselves and we follow the rules. Once things start to open up at the end of this month, we will be able to see whether that's true or not. And I think at that point, we will probably find that it is true uh, and that it is under control and that we do, barring any major uh, outbreaks of any new rampant variant, we do have things under control. So I think perhaps we are looking at the reason for this being political rather than medical. Where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in the position where we have to stop fighting amongst ourselves and have to start fighting for independence. And the timescale for that, assuming that all goes well, the referendum uh, is, is on ice for the moment. But let's assume that the election is won, that there is a healthy majority, say 25 to 35, something like that, whatever it is. But let's say we've got a good majority. Whether it's a supermajority or not doesn't concern me as long as it's a big majority. Because the next step in the, the journey towards independence is to get the independence referendum bill passed through Holyrood. It's been published by the SNP just before the recess. So it will be ready on the floor of the House waiting to uh, be discussed, to be debated, to be amended and finally voted upon. And at that point, we then need to start talking about when that happens. And that is a matter for government, but it's also a matter for Parliament to decide. More important than anything else, Parliament has to agree on the timing of this referendum. And not, as I say, simply because of COVID, but because we need to see a recovery uh, in the numbers. We need to see the figures going back up to 58% or beyond that, if possible. The SNP said it doesn't believe in going for a referendum where there is a 50% chance that they're not going to win it. That would be a huge gamble. So it's down to all of us to convince everybody else out there that independence is what we need to, to get. And I don't think the argument really is all that difficult to make anymore. We've seen the damage that Brexit is already doing to Scotland's economy. We're seeing every single um, food manufacturing, um, sorry, food exporting business in Scotland being crippled by Brexit. Some of them crippled so badly that they just simply cannot export at all and companies are going to the wall. So the imperative to leave the, the union is very, very immediate. So we need to convince people that we have the right of it. If we are seen to be fighting amongst ourselves and settling scores, then people are going to be chased away from independence. And that is the danger of the situation that we're currently in. So let's fight the election 
but let's fight the election based on policies and stop trying to settle scores and let's stop arguing amongst ourselves about whose party is the least worst because every party has made mistakes every party has done things which are either questionable or wrong and there will be arguments about that forever i mean let's face it that's politics that's what it's like so it seems to me that we have reached a point in the history of this movement or this community this independence community where we have to stop the bickering it's very easy incidentally for the united kingdom to drive a wedge between us we've seen that all it took was one person within the civil service at Holyrood to drop Alex Salmon's name into the ear of the press um, when there was allegations made against him in this internal inquiry into his behaviour 20 years ago. And it was that that sparked the whole uh, witch hunt and the whole court action and all the rest of it. That's in the past now and I think we have to focus entirely now on building the support back up to where it was before and beyond that we need 58 percent plus now and we can't get that if we're driving potential independence voters away by the unedifying sight of us slagging each other off in the in social media because that is where we're at at the moment i'm not saying we should wish for india that's that's another strap line that i disagree with there are all sorts of strap lines which i disagree with whether you support the supermajority or not doesn't matter. What matters is that you support a majority, a big majority. If we can replicate the kind of voting patterns that we produced in 2011, where we broke a system which was supposed to be impossible, then we have a good chance of getting what we need. Once the momentum is with us again after the election, people will start to come back to the independence campaign and start to say right okay it's time for me to join it but only if we stop the bickering so let me just put out a little appeal to all of you out there today for calm it's very easy to get drawn into arguments about who did what uh, and who set who up and who has a vendetta against who the scots are brilliant at snatching defeat from the jaws of victory let's not make that mistake here this is not a scotland world cup qualifier this is the entire future of the country at stake we can't afford to lose this my guess at the moment is that after the election and after the uh, legislation has been voted through in parliament where we have a referendum bill the first thing that will happen is the united kingdom will challenge that in the courts they were probably already doing that i think but that aside that then leaves us fighting an, ind an independent campaign for a referendum which we know is not going to have the Section 30 order. Everybody, uh, I think, who is involved in this sees the folly of the Section 30 order. But we go through the motions of asking for it anyway. It gets denied. What happens next? What happens next is we have to hold the referendum because to do anything else would be stupid. If we postpone the referendum and kick it down the road another few years, then we will simply lose the momentum we already have. So there will come a point, somebody said to me this morning, they thought that the likelihood is that the referendum will happen in the early part of next year, uh, simply because of all these problems. It's possible. I mean, it might happen um, as early as September, October, but a lot of things would have to go right first. And all of these arguments would have to stop first. Uh, in order for us to have any kind of a chance to do that. So remember, we are trying to convince other Scots that independence is a good idea, but we can't do that if we're being seen as fighting amongst ourselves. We are not fighting the common enemy here. We are literally just squabbling with each other over things that have happened in the past. Let's stop doing that. Put it aside. Let's fight for independence. Let's all get back to where we were before the Alex Salmond scandal was launched upon us. And I'm willing to bet you a large sum of money that most of what happened to Mr Salmond and how the First Minister was dragged into this was orchestrated and not necessarily by the main players, but was orchestrated by others who don't have independence at heart. Whatever your feelings on the matter, these are the facts as I see them at the moment. So my guess is that we will get our independence referendum sooner rather than later. I don't think it will be anywhere near as late 
as 2023, because to do that would be crazy. We need to build on the momentum we already have. We already have around about 53% in favour of independence. We can build that back up. We've only got to build the six or seven points back up that we've already lost, and we're back up at 58%. Then it's a matter of driving a few more percentage points. We get to 60%, then we have that cushion. At that point, the SNP will feel confident enough to go for the referendum, but they're not going to go for it until they're certain they can win it. They've said that time upon number. They will not go for a referendum that can't be won or where there's a 50% chance of winning it. It needs to be better odds than that. If you're a betting person, you know yourself that the odds need to be better than that. Otherwise, you're just simply gambling on what could be the last chance to gain independence for the country at a critical time in its history when it really desperately needs to escape Brexit. So let's just think on these facts a little bit. But remember, COVID-19 is not the main problem here. It's not the reason why the independence referendum, in my view anyway, um, has got to be put back a little bit. It's because we have to rebuild trust and we can't rebuild trust when people are watching us fighting each other. Who is going to trust a party or a group which is divided? It's an old, old sort of axiomatic truth that parties or groups which are divided do not get elected. And in the case of an independence referendum, we cannot get other people's support unless we are at peace with ourselves and all fighting for the same thing. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.